Howdy, howdy, everyone. Well, uh, if that countdown didn't uh, get your morning, afternoon, or evening started, then uh, maybe maybe another cup of coffee might do. Uh, <laughs> thank you all for joining us today. Uh, welcome to Cloud Native Live, where we dive into the code behind Cloud Native. I'm Taylor Dolezal, a senior developer advocate at HashiCorp, focused on all things infrastructure, application delivery, and developer experience. Every week, we bring on a new set of presenters to showcase how to work with cloud native technologies. They will build things, they will break things, and they will answer your questions. Join us every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. This week, we have Jason uh, DeTiberis here with us to talk about the cluster API with a bit of pixie dust. Uh, I gotta say, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to this magical presentation today. Uh, also join us for KubeCon and Cloud Native Con Virtual North America from October 11th to the 15th to hear the latest from the Cloud Native community. This is an official live stream of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Uh, please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that Code of Conduct. Uh, basically, please be excellent to one another. Uh, really looking forward to, to having fun today. With that, uh, I'd like to hand it over to Jason to kick off today's presentation. Yeah, so uh, as Taylor said, my name is Jason DeTiberis. Uh, I am a principal software engineer at Equinix Metal, uh, the cloud provider formerly known as Packet. Uh, I know some folks in the community may know that name a little bit more. Um, and uh, you know, I've been working on infrastructure, uh, specifically Kubernetes infrastructure since about 2015 now. And for the last year, I've been working primarily on how do we enable that infrastructure um, in a data center in a more cloud native way? Um, you know, how can we take these experiences for managing Kubernetes clusters in the cloud and actually apply those uh, in a data center on bare metal, uh, whether it's a bare metal cloud provider like we have at Equinix Metal or your own data center. So uh, let me take you into, uh, my data center here, um, I refer to this as US Detiber One. And uh, what we have here is uh, five small form factor AMD Nook like machines. And on the right is just a little mini ITX box that's running Tinkerbell. And, and we'll get into what Tinkerbell is in a moment. Um, but these uh, five small fo form factor machines, uh, hopefully by the end of the demo I have today, uh, will become part of a actual Kubernetes cluster. Um, and there's nothing on them to start with. Um, and we should be able to bootstrap them, you know, from zero to Kubernetes relatively quickly today, assuming everything works. If not, we can dive into, um, you know, how to troubleshoot this and, you know, more of what's going on along the way. But um, that's kind of the overview. Um, I do have a slide deck with me today um, to just kind of go over the basics because I'm going to assume that not everybody watching today knows um, all of the background technologies that I'm talking about. So if we can just get those slides up and we can go ahead and skip past a couple of these. Um, but uh, the, the first technology to talk about today that's going to underlie how we're going to manage these uh, physical machines um, is cluster API. And basically, you know, if we want to distill it down into the basics, uh, cluster API is a, you know, a project that's sponsored by Kubernetes SIG Cluster Lifecycle. That's the special interest group in Kubernetes dedicated to trying to improve the lifecycle management of Kubernetes clusters in general. Um, and the goal of the project is to provide a declarative set of APIs similar to Kubernetes, the, the, what Kubernetes provides for applications, uh, but you know, apply it to the infrastructure management that you need for running Kubernetes clusters themselves, including installation, upgrade, um, and you know, anything else that you need to do to tweak the configuration of a running Kubernetes cluster uh, from the infrastructure side. Um, and, you know, basically the way it works, uh, we actually use Kubernetes to manage Kubernetes. Um, so for cluster API, there is a Kubernetes cluster that is running somewhere. Um, you deploy the cluster API components to it, 
uh, you define the cluster like you would any other Kubernetes resource, you know, basically just a big old ball of YAML. You throw it at the API server and out the other end, you get a Kubernetes cluster. And that could be running in one of the various different um, supported infrastructure providers that cluster API supports. Uh, anything from AWS to vSphere to Equinix Metal, and uh, now uh, even Tinkerbell for uh, running bare metal. Um, and that's, I think, basically all I want to do for Cluster API. But if anybody has questions as we get along, we can easily dive uh, deeper into that. Um, the other project that I've already mentioned is Tinkerbell. And uh, Tinkerbell is basically trying to take what Kubernetes did and uh, apply that API-centric management to actual physical infrastructure in a data center. Um, a lot of the existing tools that are out there in the infrastructure management space to do things like provision OSs on machines, uh, be able to you know, uh, boot machines over the network, uh, all of that. Um, you know, a lot of the systems that were uh, previously designed were designed before, you know, cloud native was really a thing. And Tinkerbell is trying to basically take those cloud native approaches and uh, apply it to that infrastructure space. Um, and there's a few different components in there. And because we're building on top of Tinkerbell, uh, probably go into it uh, a little bit more. Um, there's uh, several different uh, microservices that make up what we call Tinkerbell. Um, the main one is the actual Tinkerbell workflow engine itself. And uh, this is basically what runs uh, underlying. It's the, you know, connects to the data store. It uh, provides the uh, basic API for interacting with uh, the hardware. Um, and there's three basic resources in Tinkerbell, a, a hardware, a template, and a workflow. Um, the hardware is actually, you know, the description of the infrastructure that you're going to manage itself. Uh, so you point it towards, you know, the, the actual machine, you give it the MAC addresses for the machine, uh, what IP addresses you expect that, that machine to have, and some other basic definitions. And we can dive into that when we get into the demo too. Uh, but it's basically a description of the hardware that Tinkerbell is expected to manage. Um, and then you define a set of actions that you want to do on that uh, hardware uh, through what's called a template. And that template basically just says, you know, do this step, do that step, you know, uh, until you get to the end of whatever it is you want to do. Uh, in the general case, we talk about provisioning OSs on machines. In this case, we're talking about provisioning Kubernetes on a machine. Uh, but it doesn't even need to be that. Uh, you can actually do other tasks that you might need to do on infrastructure like, uh, you know, update the, you know, firmware on all the machines that you have in the data center. You could define those types of actions. Uh, the other primitive, uh, the workflow, basically just takes those other two primitives and ties them together so that Tinkerbell knows that there's an actionable thing that you need to do. So the workflow just says, take this template, apply this hardware to this template, and go and do the thing. And that's where the other microservices start to get involved as well. So, you know, I mentioned the Tinkerbell uh, workflow engine. There's also a boot service. This provides the basic uh, DHCP Pixie booting services uh, that are needed by Tinkerbell. Uh, so that, you know, basically provides, you know, IP addressing to the hosts uh, based on what you've defined in Tinkerbell. It also provides uh, a way to network boot those hosts and uh, get into a minimal OS environment that we can then run the Tinkerbell workflows from. Uh, there's also a uh, Hegel metadata service, and this we leverage quite heavily uh, with the cluster API integration, uh, because in general, when you're bootstrapping cluster API cluster, it expects that you can shove user data somewhere and be able to you you know take that user data and run it as a script on the host when you come up. So uh, it this is what actually lets the Tinkerbell environment act like a real cloud provider instead of you know just uh, you know the the basic uh, Pixie boot environments uh, that a lot of people are familiar with. Um, and then the other uh, component is the uh, actual worker. 
And this is just uh, basically a client that connects to Tinkerbell and says, you know, do I have any workflows assigned? What are they? And goes off and executes the uh, actual actions that make up those steps. Um, and that's all run in what we've generally called a uh, minimal uh, operating system installation environment. And that's just a slim down OS that does nothing but boots up, runs that Tinkerbell worker, contacts Tinkerbell, and uh, does what it needs to do. Um, and the one other project that I'm going to bring up today, and I haven't yet mentioned it, uh, but because we are talking about uh, HA Kubernetes clusters, uh, one of the biggest requirements that you have there is you need some way to have a pers persistent endpoint that stays constant uh, for the life of that cluster, whether that is a load balancer of some kind or a virtual IP address that can be migrated between the machines. You know, you have elastic IPs in uh, actual cloud providers, you can do it through, um, you know, various different types of virtual IP mechanisms uh, running on hosts or, you know, through a load balancer. And, uh, you know, because a lot of the things that we do in the Tinkerbell space, we try to keep things as simple as possible um, and try to keep things as, um, you know, a, a minimal as you know, what's the minimal way that we can do this to provide the exact functionality that we need and not try to take on any additional uh, management. So when we looked at how do we enable HA for these clusters, uh, you know, we wanted to avoid doing things like trying to spin up an HA proxy load balancer and manage, you know, the uh, the backend endpoints on that HA proxy load balancer or, or anything like that. And that's where KubeVip comes in. And it's basically a project that manages, um, you know, virtual IPs either for uh, the Kubernetes control plane or uh, of services of type load balancer for Kubernetes. And in our case, we're doing the control plane load balancing. And, you know, it does this through a couple of different mechanisms that are involved. Um, it can either do it through uh, ARP advertisements of the virtual IP address, or it can do uh, BGP-based configuration and actually publish uh, the BGP uh, address out to different BGP peers. And uh, then you enable like, you know, full um, active active type you know, load balancing, you know, essentially uh, behind, you know, BGP. Um, in our case, uh, for the demo today, we're using ARP-based uh, just to keep the simplicity down. Uh, in the environment that I have here, I did, you know, it didn't require having to set up a, a BGP server and, you know, publishing those routes anywhere to uh, enable access to that. So in my case, I can just do the, you know, ARP uh, advertisements and, and be done with it. Um, I, you know, in this link, there's also um, links out to all of these different projects and uh, the demo script that uh, I'll be running through today as well, uh, because hopefully, you know, if everything works well, uh, I'll be able to run through actually creating, you know, a Kubernetes cluster using this. And I want to pause there if there are any questions or uh, anybody wants any clarification on anything that I've kind of run through real quick? Awesome, awesome. I haven't seen any questions come in yet, but if you do have any, please uh, feel free to ask them and we can get to those. Uh, clearly, Jason, we've come a very long way from cubeup.sh. So very, <laughs> very yeah. excited to see that. <laughs> Yeah, and um, like I said, the the idea here is, you know, the cluster API project has shown being able to create, you know, Kubernetes clusters and be able to more easily manage these clusters across various different cloud providers. And uh, there have been a few attempts uh, in the past at doing that in uh, data centers as well. Uh, with uh, our approach with Tinkerbell, though, we wanted to try to take as cloud native as an approach that as we could. Um, you know, try not to basically shoehorn, you know, cloud native management through cluster API into that traditional data center management. You know, how can we, you know, more accurately do real cloud native management in the data center? Um, so in this environment right now, I've already stood up 
uh, cluster API and a local kind cluster. Uh, I've already got the cluster API provider Tinkerbell stuff already installed, basically just to save uh, the time for bootstrapping that bit. And if I come in here, um, actually, I think it's kubectl API resources. Um, we can see here that the first thing you'll notice is, is there's three uh, entries down here, uh, hardware templates and workflow uh, related to Tinkerbell. And these uh, basically just coincide with the hardware uh, templates and workflows that I discussed earlier. Uh, this just exposes them through a thin shim layer through the Kubernetes API instead of having to talk directly to uh, Tinkerbell, uh, it gives me the opportunity that as we start defining these things, I can actually look at the status of them you know, through Kubernetes instead of having to switch back and forth uh, to Tinkerbell and, and back. Um, but we also have you know, some resources re related to cluster API for Tinkerbell, specifically these Tinkerbell clusters, Tinkerbell machines, and Tinkerbell machine templates which coincide to the same similar types that are exposed by the other infrastructure providers. Uh, just in our case, you know, they're Tinkerbell specific. And this is what's going to let us define the cluster there. Um, so at this point, if I actually do uh, kubectl get hardware, uh, we'll see that there's nothing actually found here. I haven't actually defined anything uh, in Kubernetes related to this. Uh, but if I come over here and I'm going to uh, cheat here a little bit. Um, I've already predefined, uh, you know, five hardware resources related to the um, small factor machines that I have over here. And if I switch back over um, to the hardware cam, uh, folks that are there, um, they're basically labeled A, B, C, D, E uh, from the bottom to the top. Um, so I've also cheated a little bit and given these IDs uh suffixes that you know correspond to those so that i can more easily identify which you know pieces of hardware we need to toggle as we need to toggle them uh as we go along but if i come back here and uh actually first go to my cheat sheet um and as i mentioned the link to this is in that slide deck um i can come over here and i can basically create this hardware that screen. And all right, so the hardware is now created. Uh, we see it in Kubernetes. And if we describe it, we'll get some more information about it. And this is all stuff that I've predefined within Tinkerbell for the purposes of uh, the cluster API integration. And if I take this one in particular, uh, what we see is, is there's a spec, the ID, and this associates with the uh, ID of the resource within Tinkerbell itself. And then the status is gone and populated with the actual information from uh, that was defined in Tinkerbell. Um, so basically what we can see here is there's uh, metadata defined on that instance. Um, it's just some basic metadata that Cloud and it's going to be able to use to uh, pre-populate things as we bootstrap things along. Um, we've defined that we do want this to uh, be able to pixie boot and we do want to allow it to run workflows. And we've defined it an actual IP address. Uh, and this is the MAC address associated with the with the actual hardware, and that's what's really going to tie everything together. You know, the request is going to come in saying uh, it's coming from this MAC address. You know, the DHCP request, give me an IP, and then everything goes from there. Um, the other important thing is is that I've uh, defined uh, a disk device here as well, and that's important because when we go to actually bootstrap this machine, we need to be able to know where to actually write that information. And the way hardware is, uh, that could be varied from device to device. So currently we require people to like predefine it. Uh, eventually we'll be able to add support to auto detect this stuff and populate it as we need to. Um, the, you know, the challenge here is, is uh, 
we can't just assume that like the first block device we find is some that we can write to because if you look at like some ARM hardware and things like that, uh, sometimes you'll have an SD card that contains your actual firmware uh, that you're, you know, bootstrapping the device with. And if you overwrite that, now you've just broken all booting of that machine. So uh, in this case, you know, you tell it where you want it to be able to deploy to as a prerequisite. Um, and I see uh, somebody did ask about BMC support in PB&J. Um, we haven't uh, integrated PB&J yet into uh, this workflow, uh, but we do plan on adding that in the future. Um, you know, the, the hardware that I have here actually wouldn't even work with PB&J because the remote management is Dash-based and that's you know, a whole nother specification outside of things like IPMI and um, Redfish and things like that that uh, are supported by PB&J. Uh, but server class hardware is supported by PB&J and uh, we can integrate that into those workflows. Uh, the main thing that's been stopping us right now is uh, we want to make sure that as we're integrating that into um, kind of the standard upstream, for lack of a better term, reference architecture for Tinkerbell, and into the cluster API integration uh, that we're kind of doing it in the best way possible because there's various different ways that we can, uh, you know, add support for it. We can add workflows that go off and you know process the PB and J type requests. We can uh, kind of build it in a little bit more uh, automated in different fashions, either through the cluster API integration or uh, through Tinkerbell itself. And we want to try to make sure that we're doing that integration properly instead of trying to rush, you know, the, uh, the most expedient solution out of the box for us. All right. Um, and at this point, I've got the hardware defined. Uh, there's nothing else defined. So at this point, we can go ahead and start making a cluster. Um, and I'm going to copy and paste here again. And I will describe exactly what I'm running before I do this. Um, so anybody who's already familiar with Cluster API, um, there's uh, pre-published templates that we have for the Cluster API resources to make a cluster. Um, we're leveraging the same thing here, and we're specifying some specific variables that get plugged in there uh, in order to be able to actually create the machine. Um, the first one here is this uh, control plane VIP. And this is actually uh, the IP address that's going to be managed by kubevip and migrated around as needed through the cluster. Um, and we're also specifying the pod CIDR here. And this is actually important for uh, my demo use case because the default pod CIDR uh, would actually conflict with the physical networking that I have for this lab environment. Um, so I'm overriding that to avoid, um, you know, uh, having having to deal with IP address and routing issues. Um, the other things are basically, you know, just the basic things we're saying to start with, we just want a single control plane machine. Uh, don't create any worker machines to start. And that's just to kind of serialize the startup a little bit for our purposes, because I have to toggle these machines somewhat manually. And uh, we're also specifying the Kubernetes version. and you know, what that does is, uh, you know, we've actually pre-built images with, Kubernetes, with the Kubernetes components already in there. Uh, this is some that most of the other uh, cloud provider implementations for cluster API have done. We followed the same suit. And right now for uh, the way things are configured for this demo environment, that actually sits on a web server uh, on the Tinkerbell host that I have here. Um, so, that's the version of Kubernetes for the image that I previously built. Um, we are looking in the future to move to um, OCI registry-based distribution of the uh, operating system images uh, that contain Kubernetes. And once we do that, we'll be able to actually stream them uh, live from the web pretty much anywhere. And I'd be able to have a little bit more flexibility for which um, which Kubernetes version I was doing, but for right now, this is the only version that 
I have an image available for right now. All right, so at this point, um, I've created the cluster and I can uh, run basically uh, kubectl get cluster API here. We'll get everything that's associated itself with the um, cluster API category. So this is all of the main uh, cluster API resources, plus also the uh, Tinkerbell cluster API resources that uh, I've defined as well. And we can see here, you know, we have a few different resources. We have the cluster, uh, we have some machines, uh, we have this kubeadm control plane machine, which actually manages uh, the control plane for us based off of kubeadm, uh, another uh, SIG cluster life cycle uh, project for helping to bootstrap clusters. Um, we can also see that it's tried to create one replica. Um, that replica is up to date according to the configuration, but it's unavailable right now. And uh, that's because I haven't actually turned on the machine and hasn't bootstrapped yet. Um, the other thing we can see is that here's this Tinkerbell machine. Uh, this is the bit that's actually associating that uh, a cluster API machine with the uh, actual Tinkerbell infrastructure. And it's gonna tell me that, uh, you know, it assigned it to this instance ID, which uh, basically just gives me the UID of that hardware device. And because I cheated a little bit with the, uh, UID creation here. I know that's related to the uh, uh, hardware D box that I have over here. So if I switch over here and my VM locked up. So in this case, uh, what I will do instead of triggering it remotely, I'll just go over and power it on real quick by hand. All right, so uh, that's coming up now. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, I can't even redirect the text console because that Windows machine locked up right now. Uh, but uh, I can tell you that it is going ahead and bootstrapping. Uh, it is attempting to uh, pixie boot uh, against boots. Uh, it's going to get that um, minimal uh, operating system installation environment image. It's going to run that and it's going to start executing the uh, Tinkerbell workflow which is the more important thing. And I can show you basically what cluster API is created as far as that workflow. So, uh, workflow, actually, let's describe it. And because I've serialized the creation with just one control plane instance right now, I can just describe, you know, workflow. I don't have to specify which one. Um, and we can see here that basically these are the individual tasks that it's going to run as it goes along. Um, let's see. All right. Yep. All right. So um, the first the first task that it's going to run, it's going to go ahead and stream the image. This is that pre-created image uh, that I've already created. Um, it's templating out the URL based on some configuration that I've given it. I told it that Tinkerbell uh, can be found, the Tinkerbell host can be found at 192.168.1.1 uh, colon 8080. So that's filling that in for us. Uh, I've told it that I want to use Ubuntu 2004 uh, through the, um, the resource that I created through that template. And I told it I wanted Kubernetes version 1.18.15. And uh, the important part here is we see that the destination disk uh, this is actually using that data that we pre-populated in the hardware to fill this in. Um, so it's right into that disk device that we predefined uh, when we configured the hardware. Um, it's also adding a basic cloud in it uh, config on top of that image. And this is just so that um, cloud in it will actually run against the Hegel metadata service that we have. Um, so we specify uh, this link local address, which I configured this Tinkerbell machine uh, to listen on. Uh, that port, you know, 50,061 is the Hegel default port. So it's going to go ahead and contact the meta server uh, that we have set up. And uh, I've also given it some basic, uh, a basic default user to set up so that if I wanted to, I could uh, create a cluster uh, defined in a way that would let me inject my SSH key 
uh, through the cluster configuration and be able to access this remotely. As it is, I didn't specify that right now. So if this actually fails to boot up, uh, I'm going to have no way to troubleshoot it unless we kind of modify that. Um, the other thing is, is we're dropping in a uh, DS identify configuration and telling it that we want it to use the uh, EC2 metadata source. And this is because uh, the way that CloudInit does the data source detection, uh, if we didn't tell it, force it to use the EC2 metadata service, um, it would default to no metadata service at all. And the last thing we do is we uh, issue a K exec and that actually, you know, uh, executes the kernel that we just streamed to that disk via the uh, uh, previous steps. Um, now, the one thing that you'll notice is, is that in none of this is the actual steps for bootstrapping cluster API itself. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we're contacting the Hegel metadata service and that's where that's getting that from. So if I actually go and describe that hardware B machine, Oh. Uh, what we'll see here is uh, there's a lot more uh, information here. And this is basically uh, all the information uh, that Cluster API created uh, for Bootstrap in this cluster. Um, and it created it in the user data section of the metadata. So when CloudInit runs, it's going to find this and uh, it's going to go ahead and execute the script just as if it was, you know, one of the other, you know, real clouds, so to speak. Um, so with all of that out of the way, this machine should actually be bootstrapped by now. So if I do another get on cluster API, um, we do see that that is ready. We got the machine. We got the kubeadm control plane. And it looks like it is unavailable. Um, so let me go ahead and um, well, let me see. What what is the name of that cluster? That demo. Okay, so I can use that. All right. And if I can type today, um, I can get the cube config for it. And sure enough, that machine failed to boot on me. So that is fun. Um, <laughs> As as is such with live demos, always uh always they always like to throw a wrench in the plans at the best of times. <laughs> so let's see. Um, we can go into this and let's see. That's one oh eight. So the machine is up. And that is interesting. I think that machine, you know what it is? I bet the when I was running through the demo the first time, it injected a new boot device in that machine for the disk that I deployed to. And it pre-booted into that. And that's why I was actually able to SSH into it because I did not define the uh, SSH key uh, with this cluster that I created. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So that <laughs> is fun. Um, so what would have happened, you know, in the case is this would have bootstrapped up. Uh, it would have configured uh, kubevip uh, as part of that bootstrap process with that, you know, uh, virtual IP that we defined. Um, and then at that point, um, this machine would be up, we could apply a CNI, um, and then we would be able to scale the 
clusters up at that point. Um, but it's kind of hard to proceed from this point without breaking out a keyboard and monitor. And that's going to be a bit awkward for this, uh, especially since that Windows VM locked up on me uh, for the bit of remote management I could do on these machines. Um, so yes, uh, I would uh, gladly be able to chat offline uh, about, um, you know, how do we enable the remote management of uh, things like power and boot order uh, for the machines, uh, especially with concerns around IPMI, things like that. Um, I know there are things that we have done internally at Equinix Metal where we can be a lot more uh, opinionated um, to help with those things, uh, such as you know, updating you know most of the hardware that we have to run uh, OpenBMC and being able to conf you know configure. Uh, things on the firmware side that uh, most folks in a data center probably aren't doing or don't want to do. Um, so as we start adding things like PB&J support, uh, we want to make sure that we're not just supporting that overly opinionated environment that we care about internally, uh, but also how do we support uh, things that folks are going to hit in the real world as well. And that's likely to be, you know, be able to support things like, um, you know, some of the consumer based hardware, whether it's like these uh, AMD based boxes with Dash or uh, the Intel uh, based stuff with their uh, management uh, firmware. Um, and with that, um, you know, obviously it's kind of hard to show the actual HA capabilities here, um, but you know, Qubit basically acts like uh, a Kubernetes controller. Uh, it keeps an eye on things. It uses leader election to determine uh, who is the uh, primary machine, uh, at least in the ARP case, which uh, is what we have configured uh, here. Uh, so basically, whichever one is able to connect to the local API server and declare itself the leader, uh, that's the one that's going to advertise that uh, the uh, ARP for the uh, VIP that we've defined. Um, so that ensures that, you know, uh, that, you know, there's minimal interruption of that IP basically, um, you know, as things go along, uh, for folks that want more highly available machines, be able to do things like, uh, be able to scale out requests across multiple API servers, uh, the BGP based configuration, um, you know, is there for that. And, uh, there's also been additional support added for, uh, being able to update DHCP uh, as well. So, you know, even if you don't want to deal with BGP and you have access to being able to access DHCP, that's another alternative there. Uh, but we also want to make sure that we don't make things overly opinionated and only support KubeVIP. We want to be able to support other types of load balancers as well. And as Cluster API uh, figures out how to do kind of proper, like, load balancer support, uh, across different providers, um, we'll be able to, you know, integrate with that and consume things because right now um, there's other providers that have multiple load balancer options, and some of those are, you know, easily applicable to uh, other providers as well, especially the in data center ones, whether it's the OpenStack provider or um, the vSphere provider or Tinkerbell, uh, MetalCube, all of those. Uh, so we want to maybe. We don't want to require each of those infrastructure providers to redefine all of the load balancers that they want to support, that sort of thing. Uh, so that'll be coming at some point in the future. Um, but for now, Qubit was kind of the minimal way to get that uh, HA support, um, you know, on physical hardware without requiring, you know, crazy management of uh, external machines and all of the complications and all of the things that can go wrong along the way. Uh, in doing so. Um, I did also mention that uh, right now uh, the image streaming is done off of a uh, web server. Um, there's been support added to the uh, Tinkerbell tooling uh, and some of the uh, predefined actions uh, to actually support pushing and uh, pulling images uh, directly from an OCI-based registry using the ORAS tool. Uh, 
Um, so we're looking at uh, adopting that as well for this uh, integration, uh, which means kind of one less requirement that you have for kind of bootstrapping the environment to get started. Um, and it simplifies the management and will give us the ability to actually have uh, public images available similar to like the AWS provider and some of the other ones. Uh, not that we would recommend folks do that in production environments. We would want folks to kind of create their own images and, uh, you know, do the types of verification with their own workloads uh, that they'll be running on the cluster uh, to ensure that, you know, everything works like they want. Uh, but, uh, you know, having those images available for the initial, you know, POC use case or, or demo use case uh, would greatly simplify standup of uh, the environment. One, one question that I had for you there, Jason, was kind of the, it, I've liked how you've gone through and kind of described each of these uh, abstractions with the project, with Cluster API, with Tinkerbell. Um, were there any uh, were there any abstractions that you came across that kind of were intentional at first, or were there some that were things that you really didn't see coming and then you're like, we should draw a line here or, or kind of draw out that abstraction when it came to composing uh, this, this project and working with these tools? Yeah, so I think I briefly touched that touched on that a bit with like the load balancer and you know uh, and and trying to add that as like a first class citizen with like cluster API, uh, you know when we started, um, you know part of it was is uh, you know not necessarily not seeing the need for those abstractions, uh, but trying to limit the complexity and the uh, you know, the amount of work it takes for an initial implementation to go. Uh, so we tried to stay, um, you know, very minimal with the cluster API abstractions, especially uh, in the in the early days. Um, but we tried not to be overly simplistic at the same point. You know, the idea wasn't to basically define an arbitrary, you know, one cloud abstraction to rule them all type of uh, abstraction because you know that's been tried various places in the past and every place that it's worked you end up with you know a least common denominator that ends up you know working good for you know generally a demo POC use case and very limited kind of production use cases and you know generally folks pretty quickly outgrow those super you know limited abstractions when you try to abstract them across all providers. Um, so, you know, that's the reason why, you know, when we define the resources, you know, there's this uh, Tinkerbell machine in addition to a machine resource. Uh, we didn't want to try to abstract things away too much with the, um, with the way that we were defining things. Uh, but at the same point, you know, uh, there were plenty of us in, you know, who talked about, you know, how do we support use cases outside of the cloud? And you know some of the things that are going to be important there, especially if we don't want every single you know on-premises you know deployment to have to define their own particular cloud provider. Um, and and we took that limitation at first uh, to try to get the you know project bootstrapped. You know in some cases you know simplify you know the conversations that you're having uh, to come up with consensus among contributors, all of that stuff. Uh, the more stuff that you can kind of throw out of those early conversations, the easier it is to great, you know, create consensus and, and be able to get started. Um, but as we start seeing more adoption in other places, now uh, some of those ideas are starting to bubble up and become bigger pain points. So uh, I know in addition to uh, the uh, proposal that's out there being worked on for adding load balancer support, uh, there's other folks that are looking to add things like uh, IP address management support uh, to cluster API proper, which is something that uh, will come in uh, great, you know, really handy to us on the uh, Tinkerbell side, uh, because right now we define require people to predefine, you know, the IP addresses on all these hardware devices. Uh, but if we can integrate with, you know, some type of you know, authoritative IP address management solution that would give us the ability to uh, be a bit more flexible there. Um, 
you know, other places where I see room for abstraction as well is, you know, especially on the, you know, data center front, um, you know, being able to configure uh, firewalls and, you know, uh, equivalent to, you know, security groups in the clouds, you know, being able to define those types of things to provide more granular external restriction of, you know, what devices can communicate with other devices, um, that sort of thing. Um, you know, and, and that's going to be something that's different for, you know, pretty much every on-premises environment, depending on what, you know, uh, vendor they, you know, go f go through for that type of solution. Or if they've, you know, in some cases now with software-defined networking, written their own solution in that area. Um, the, other, the other aspect, too, is, you know, more granular control over networking. Um, you know, right now, you know, in the major cloud providers, you can generally be kind of um, opinionated in those things. You know, in AWS, everything is VPC based now. Uh, but you know, uh, when you start looking at things like um, uh, OpenStack or you know vSphere or uh, Tinkerbell, you know what's going to be available networking wise to provide that kind of uh, automated networking configuration is going to be uh, a lot more diverse uh, than you see with kind of the major cloud providers. Um, so we want to be able to, you know, we'll eventually want to be able to support those types of abstractions as well. And whether those are proper abstractions within cluster API that are shared globally, or they're, uh, you know, external abstractions that are shared between multiple providers, that's yet to be seen. Uh, but I fully expect at some point we're going to see that, you know, in an ideal world, I would love, a you know, the ability for folks to be able to treat their data centers like, you know, AWS does, like, you know, Google does or, you know, uh, any of the large, you know, uh, operators, you know, they should be able to just rack and stack machines, have them automatically become available, be used as needed if you have a hardware fault. Um, you know, you're not troubleshooting down, you know, individual hardware faults within an individual device. You're basically ripping and replacing that device because it's cheaper than, um, you know, a person's time and labor uh, to replace the physical hardware than it is to, you know, deal with troubleshooting down, you know, a failed, you know, RAM module. Um, you know, and, and, you know, being able to do that, but also provide things like, you um, virtual network isolation so that, hey, I want this, you know, these turn these machines into a Kubernetes cluster, they get deployed on their own separate VLAN with the proper, you know, ingress and egress routing uh, that it needs for that, uh, more granular than that, you know, that would provide, you know, uh, granular restrictions between clusters themselves, at least at, you know, the virtual level, you know, um, you know, I'm not going to say it'll be, you know, the same as physical hardware network separation, but you know it, it's much improved over just throwing everything on the same uh, L2 broadcast domain type of thing. Um, and then you know with the firewall type thing, you know being able to integrate at that level and be able to say that you know a workload running on you know this subset of worker machines cannot access the um, you know these various ports outside of the you know prescripted you know, networking ports to access the internal, you know, API server client, that sort of thing, uh, you know, would provide, you know, more isolated restriction on a per workload basis as well. Um, so um, I, I see those things happening in the future, but again, you know, you, you can do things both faster and better by limiting the scope that you do at first. And as we define these things and hit the limitations, uh, in various areas, that's, you know, that's the beauty of the community. That's, that's when we get together and we say, you know, how do we solve this and, and what's the right approach? And uh, I, I won't say that, you know, cluster API is the perfect abstraction to rule them all around uh, declarative management of Kubernetes clusters, uh, but it seemed to do pretty well. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, the more people that adopt it, the more people we have uh, bring in their own expertise and feedback into the group, and the better we improve, you know, the entire ecosystem for everybody. And I think that's the goal that we have: is not necessarily be the best, uh, 
you know, abstraction around building a Kubernetes cluster. If I wanted to do that, I would write a super overly opinionated installer that said, you know, give me a five node cluster on AWS and that's all you, you know, that's the only input you give it and out comes a cluster. That, that'll work great for about five people. Um, you know, once you get into like the more diverse use cases, especially um, with people that are having to run, you know, uh, workloads in highly regulated environments or uh, that are running workloads that are going to be attacked by, you know, nation state level threat actors, you know, they have a lot of different requirements and we want to be able to make sure that we can uh, support all the varied use cases because similar to Cube ADM before it, uh, the thing with Cluster API is we wanted to build the next building block on top of Cube ADM to help enable folks to uh, build out and manage these these Kubernetes clusters. You know, in the early days, you know, every different uh, Kubernetes vendor, every different types of you know open source distribution, you know, you know, vanilla Kubernetes, you know, there were there were different installers and different ways to manage these things. And the hope is is to try to unify some of that effort so that not everybody's having to go out and the next Kubernetes release comes out and like, oh my God, this doesn't work with our tooling anymore. How do we reverse engineer all that stuff? You know, provide a common substrate, you know, so that, you know, people can worry more about building, you know, the actual features that the customer actually cares about. You know, at this point, I think installing and upgrading Kubernetes cluster is table stakes for anybody in the market. Um, so, you know, everybody, you know, all the customers want more focus on, well, what are you enabling for my workloads? How do I do CI, CD on top of this? How do I, um, you know, take care of some of these more, you know, complicated challenges? How do I run AI ML workloads on my, you know, cluster? How do I deal with, you know, the security aspects? And, you know, let's let everybody focus on those higher level concerns and, you know, kind of share some of that burden for, kind of the common crud that, you know, only us infrastructure geeks actually really care about. <laughs> and that's, and that's what I, I think is most helpful um, when you kind of talked about, you know, not, not having the best abstraction or things like that. Um, I, I feel like when people get to that mind space and that head space of focusing on the abstraction solely, then you kind of get into that XKCD comic, one of my favorites, where it's uh, yeah, uh, two people talking and they <laughs> and they say there are fourteen competing standards. We should make one to unite them all. And then the next <laughs> pain is there are fifteen competing standards. Uh, yeah. So so the, I, I totally feel that. And then I really like what you said around kind of you know everyone should be able to kind of work with their infrastructure, similar to these these uh, public clouds and how they uh, they handle their workloads. And I've liked seeing you know in in my uh, in my time within the industry, I've really liked taking a look at seeing the jumps back and forth between the mainframe setup and the personal computing setup. And then honestly, it really excites me to kind of be around for uh, what does a data center at home look like? You know, I, I feel like cluster API and some other things on that front allow for that. Granted, it might be some Raspberry Pi clusters or <laughs> some of the Intel nooks, but you know, nothing, nothing too wild or crazy or, you know, Hopefully we don't have to worry about like power consumption and water cooling and, you know, uh, anything like that. Uh, I'm, I'm hearkening back to the movie Goldeneye uh, in the end. Uh, if for anyone that's seen that, I won't spoil it for you, but recommend checking that out um, if you haven't seen it. But uh, it's it's really interesting to me. And, and I really like how you focused on um, and, and the community has really focused on what I would consider the right things to focus on and kind of making sure that you have that feedback from everyone. And while, you know, upgrading Kubernetes is uh, has historically been difficult to do, I really appreciate the fact that that's becoming easier and easier with each passing day. Um, when, it, when it comes to uh, making sure your workloads work on that, of course, you're going to have to experience some, some um, you know, back and forth on, uh, has this API endpoint gone from beta to GA? Mm -hmm. Like, of course, you kind of have to deal with some of those things. And Kubernetes makes a lot of those, uh, those abstractions uh, easier to work with. But I think that that's, it, it, that's also exciting to kind of be working on a platform that's going to help enable easier upgrades. So it's not like an iOS or Android or, or a core computer operating system update where it's like, 
well, I've got to rewrite all these things for all these new APIs. You know, there is a little bit of that, but it's nice to be able to have a, a little bit of a softer landing when it comes to upgrading the Kubernetes cluster and still supporting your applications. I feel like that's, yeah. it, you've really checked all the boxes on those fronts. Well, I'm glad you mentioned upgrades, actually, because I didn't really touch on this, but one of the things Cluster API does is it treats the individual nodes, you know, machines in our parlance are roughly one-to-one. -one. You know, there are edge cases where, you know, that's not the case, but it basically treats those underlying uh, instances that back that as ephemeral. You know, we don't want to treat, you know, these things as long-running snowflakes because that's where you get into the challenges of upgrades, you know, um, you know, does this specific kernel version have an issue with the specific OS packages that are installed in the way that it's used with the container runtime that you have installed with the, you know, various security configurations, you know, KMS plugins that you might have running on that individual OS with the version of Kubernetes, you know, um, I, I spent time at Red Hat in the early OpenShift v3 days, you know, there was, you know, even when we controlled the entire stack from the kernel to the Kubernetes binaries, there would still be, you know, these weird edge cases where this version of IP tables doesn't, you know, have the support for kind of fake locking uh, for the clients to use, you know, that opt-in flag that you can provide to IP tables to say, you know, I'm being a good citizen, don't modify things at the same time I am type of thing. Um, you know, that like Kubernetes, you know, adopted that. And, you know, if they were running that older version of IP tables and they didn't have it, all of a sudden, you know, Kubernetes is blowing up. And, you know, we thought we had validated, you know, all of the, you know, use cases that we cared about and we controlled all of the packages that shipped, uh, but we couldn't even prevent those types of issues. Um, so how can we do that in an unopinionated way you know, across various different operating systems, across potentially various different uh, Kubernetes distributions, not just QADM based, uh, you know, with the upstream bits. Um, you know, the, the challenge is ridiculous, and, and especially if you throw in different container runtimes in there. So the idea was, is, you know, what if we didn't worry about that? And I'd even take it a step further. And, you know, most people, you know, have various workloads running on these clusters. I would rather see people migrating their workloads between Kubernetes clusters as part of their upgrade strategy rather than upgrading in place. Because, you know, especially if you have those applications are talking to Kubernetes itself, then that's where you get into some of those issues around, you know, the, the older deprecated APIs that maybe were just working in the background and you weren't seeing the warnings on and oops, the upgrade, they're no longer working. If you're migrating the applications, then, you know, you have control over that availability and that availability to roll back that you wouldn't necessarily have with Kubernetes upgrades. Um, and I, I don't think a lot of people understand, but like rollback is quite a tricky thing in the Kubernetes world. Um, there, <laughs> there's only a limited window in the part of a Kubernetes, window, uh, Kubernetes upgrade where you can actually roll back. Um, and that's basically, you know, your... Um, the, the time that you're upgrading that control plane of that cluster, if you fully upgrade that control plane of the cluster, you know, rolling back really isn't an option anymore, not without a backup of restore of uh, etcd. And then that means you've lost state from, you know, that last backup to that current point in time. That That's a tricky thing to like try to recover from and know the implications of that recovery and, and how does that affect the workloads that you have running on it. So, um, you know, I'd much rather see people migrating those applications rather than uh, everything else, because then you can do full validation of the Kubernetes cluster, make sure that it's fully, you know, CNCF compliant. And then you can also make sure that, you know, run additional compliance checks and make sure it works for your workloads. And then know that, you know, that migration is going to happen safely and, and you don't have to worry about those edge cases around rollback. It's it's so true. I I think I've been bit by that a few times myself, just trying to upgrade in place. And it's uh it's 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 so much better when you can kind of have a you know you have a guaranteed state when you set up Kubernetes for the first time in in a lot of cases. And so that's I, I like having that certainty when getting those uh, uh, workloads moved over. Well, uh, awesome. Awesome, awesome. Uh, we are, uh, unfortunately, at time. Uh, Jason, I feel like I could talk to you all day. This has really <laughs> been fantastic. Uh, thank you so much for your demo today and for everything else. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining in. 
to the latest episode of Cloud Native Live. Uh, it was wonderful to have Jason talking about the cluster API in Tinkerbell. Uh, 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 sometime we'll have to ask him if we stop believing in fairies, will the Tinkerbell project disappear? Hopefully not. <laughs> um, <laughs> we, we really liked the interaction and questions from everyone. Thank you all for showing up. Uh, we'd like to bring we bring you the latest cloud native code every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern. Uh, next week we will have Daniel Cook presenting optimizing and securing Kubernetes workloads with Polaris and Goldilocks. I really like the progression on all these names and these uh, and, and these uh, parables and, and this. This should be fun. Thank you so much for joining us today. We will see you next week. Adios, everybody. Have a good one.